on April 3, 1973, one of the most important inventions of the 20th century was introduced. We've got a battery life of 20 minutes. Of course, that's not a problem because you couldn't hold this thing up for 20 minutes. It was the cellular telephone, and its creator was Martin Cooper. The original design was about this big. And we called it a shoe phone because it really looked somewhat like a, a shoe or a boot. People called it the shoe phone. I always called it the Cooper phone because that's where our inspiration came. The brick was just a term that, that developed, I suppose, because by the time we got it done, it was three pounds and you know 45 cubic inches. I don't know why they call this the brick. I mean, gee whiz, wouldn't you like to have a phone like this in your pocket? They called it the brick, but look at it now. Now it fits in the palm of your hand. But this was quite a revolution in the early 1970s to have a device that was handheld and could make cell phone calls. It really was so far ahead of its time. And Marty led that development. I put together a team uh, and of uh, extraordinary people. And we actually built not only a cellular handset, uh, but a complete cellular system. The idea in the uh, 1960s and uh, early 70s of carrying around a telephone on you that you could call anybody anytime, anywhere in the world, would be uh, revolutionary. It was a wild concept, even at an innovative company like Motorola. But Cooper was a minority of one, overcoming opposition and doubt. You always need someone who's a little bit contrary, who has a vision, and who will be that minority of one and eventually become the majority. At that time, in the, between 1970, mid-70s and mid-80s, uh, there were a lot of skeptics, the analysts on Wall Street. There were naysayers even at Motorola. And at Motorola in those days, you had to argue for budget money. And this new technology wasn't the greatest thing to a lot of people whose projects didn't get funded because of it. Between 1973 and 1983, we spent, remember we were just a little company, we spent over a hundred million dollars. He was always looking to the future. He knew that there was a, a product or there was a, a demand for a product like this. Marty fulfilled the model we had at Motorola of what a great leader is. A great leader has to envision the future energize the troops to get them to realize that future and to enable people to get the job done. Marty did all three in the cellular case impeccably. AT&T made an announcement. AT&T, the largest company in the world and a monopoly. They ran all telecommunications in the United States and in many other countries. And they announced that they had invented a new technology called cellular technology. AT&T wanted to put cellular technology in cars. Marty Cooper wanted to go one better, making portable cell phones for people to use individually. This concept of car telephones, for a hundred years since the telephone was invented, we had all been chained to our homes, leashed to our desks, trapped so to speak, and now we're going to be trapped in our cars. Now that didn't make any sense at all to us. So when in the 1970s the FCC starts to consider whether to grant licenses and radio spectrum for cellular telephone, Motorola puts in a competing proposal to AT&T's. There's only one way that we could really make an impression on our politicians, on the people in Washington, and that's to do a dazzling demonstration. In late 1972, the race was on, and Cooper had to move fast. He said, I got a project for you. He said, we're going to have to design a portable telephone. And I said, well, what's a portable telephone? So he picked up his phone, and he said, if I took scissors and I cut the cord off, and I walked around and I had to do everything that I do with this phone without the cord hooked up. He said, that would be a portable. He said, the real problem is we only have six weeks. Six weeks. 
not only to design the cell phone, but build the electronics to make it operational. The real haste was to try to get Motorola seen and, and respected by the FCC so that when they eventually made a decision, uh, they wouldn't have given all the business to the telephone company. And what more dazzling could there be when everybody is talking about this future technology to actually demonstrate it. On April 3rd, 1973, on a street corner in Midtown Manhattan, the first cellular phone call ever made changed the course of history, unveiling one of the most important inventions of the 20th century. And that call was made to Cooper's arch rival at AT&T. I had to decide who I was going to call, and at that moment, spontaneously, uh, I thought about, you know, I ought to call Joel Engel. Uh, Joel uh, is a very bright guy, and he managed the AT&T program. I just took a chance and called him, and guess what? He answered the phone. At that time, when you made a phone call, you were calling a place. Now, when you call somebody's cell phone, you expect them to answer. Joel Engel answered. Uh, I was thrilled. I said, Joel? I'm calling you from a cell phone, but a real cell phone, a handheld, personal, portable cell phone. And there was kind of silence on the other end of the line. It took another 10 years for Motorola to convince the Federal Communications Commission to approve a license for its cell phone, breaking the AT&T monopoly. It happened at the White House. In 1983, Bob Galvin, the CEO of Motorola, gave an impromptu demonstration to Vice President George H.W. Bush and President Ronald Reagan. So he said, what is, what is this? I said, that is a portable telephone. And he says, is it on the market yet? I said, no, your FCC will not license us. And so he turned to his associate a uh, staff man, he said, you call the chairman uh, tomorrow morning and tell him I want this thing on the market in 30 days. Now, 40 years later, more than six billion cell phones are in operation worldwide. And what once seemed an impossible idea, a portable cell phone, has become an indispensable part of our lives. We all see the consequences of what Marty did. And what's very cool about all this is that it all happened not only within his lifetime, but within his own career. That very few people who have had major, made major inventions that necessarily get to see the consequences in a period of time when they can still appreciate it. And so I think this is rather special, not only for Marty, but for the Marconi Society as well. He really is at the leading edge, be it applications, be it the infrastructure, be it the devices. He has the vision for where things should go. When I started in uh, the wireless business uh, in uh, 1954. We're only just beginning. Our industry, the telephone industry, but specifically wireless telephones, uh, is in its infancy.